today we're going to be covering how many took science took science in college. Anyone take science? In college, or maybe even in high school, if you got really good grades, you'd be in advanced. We there are certain scientific principles. How many know about the uh, three laws or four laws of thermodynamics? Never heard of it. Wow. Okay. So um, this is going to be a little bit more difficult. Okay. So um, not difficult. Well, there, there's the laws of thermodynamics, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to show off. Anyway, so um, I'm going to deal with the second law of thermodynamics. All right. And in that law, um, like we're talking about, energy cannot be destroyed. It can only be converted, right? That's the first law of thermodynamics. The second is that everything is in a state of decline. And depending on time, everything goes back to a neutral state or balanced state. If you have a car and you let it sit in your yard, after about 10 years, it's almost going back to what? To dust, right? It all starts to break down. So that's called entropy. But it's not just in things, right? If you have a house and you don't, you don't maintain it, what happens to it? You say, I got a house, but you don't maintain it. Same thing with your appearance. If you don't maintain your appearance, if you don't watch the things, you know, keep yourself in condition, then it will, you will have entropy. In some way, it looks, you can obviously, obviously this person is going into entropy. <laughs> I pronounce it different. Anyway, so this is where people don't understand. If I, if I could only own this, but owning it requires maintenance. And if you don't maintain it, then it goes to nothing. Now, the funny thing is that we've got, not funny, it's more amusing, we're, we're, we have an incubator. And then what's so funny about an incubator? No, it's the eggs in the incubator. And what's funny is we had eight eggs. We put them in the incubator. And we had four, that's half, hatch. But the other four didn't hatch. And the ones that didn't hatch, they didn't make it out of the egg. Now, why is it you can't break the, the, break the egg and get them out? All right. When I was, um, when I was, a, little, when I was a little mini person, I, I did an experiment. I saw a, butter, uh, uh, a caterpillar. I've been feeding him, and he turned into a cocoon. And I'm waiting and waiting and waiting, and like two or three weeks passed, and no butterfly yet. So when he, when he first started to crack open, I couldn't wait, and I took him all the way out. He had little bitty wings, they never grew. It never grew. So a couple days later, it died. The problem about entropy is that when there's energy to be used and it's not, then it's held back, like I did with the butterfly. It's dead. Because of taking it out of the, the cocoon, it never developed the rest of the way. So a lot of times when we take things, we find a shortcut, or we try and do things easy, and we, and we hold back, we ourselves are the entropy destroying because we're not letting all, we don't give it our whole heart. So if you don't give something your whole heart and give it everything you've got, and then maintain that, what happens is, you enter and you, whatever you hold back, you, that won't be there next time. What you gave is now your new limit. And if you do less again, then that's your new limit. Do you understand? Because the way life is, it tries to go to the average common denominator to, to, balance, to get into a balance. So this is where the problem comes in. God doesn't say, agape me with part of your heart. It says what? All your heart. All your soul. All your mind. Why all? Why not just part? How many have ever had someone love you? How many have had someone love you only halfway? And they can never go beyond that. That's as far as they can go. Because that's what they started with, and that's the standard. 
And this is what people don't understand. When you don't give something that you're going to do with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, then it's, then that's, and what happens is you break through what you thought was your limit, you break through it, and now you grow, just like that chick in the egg. That breaking through that gave the chick more strength. Having the, the butterfly break out on its own gave it more what? Strength. Unless you break through your limit, you're not going to what? Grow. And whatever you set that limit at from now on, that's the new standard. Does that make sense? This is why people say, well, why does God say all my heart, all my soul, all, your, all my mind? Because if you're going to excel in your life beyond your limits, you have to give it all you got. Because whatever you think is your limit, it's short than what you really can do. Does that make sense? So, Father, I thank you right now for helping me to teach, to really build the greatness of your word, that which is perfect, that which assures us that we can accomplish that which you've given us. The Father, you'll never put us in a situation we cannot handle. I thank you that we have the courage to be able to and the strength to go beyond what we even imagine because we have your word which is priceless and perfect. So I thank you for helping us to grow, to learn, to stand within your shadow and walk in the footsteps of your firstborn from the dead are risen and return, Lord Jesus, your anointed. Okay, so in, when we're dealing with em, uh, entropy, it's, it, it's very important to understand how this works because when you, everything, this, this table is going to eventually turn back to what? Dust. Now, when you buy food and you don't refrigerate it, what happens to it? Entropy kicks in, and that and it and it, that vegetables or whatever you bought will start to what? Decay and deteriorate. So there's this battle because the fruit, the vegetables are pulled out of the ground. They can't defend themselves. They can't give any more than what they have, and it's diminishing rapidly. And when it has no more to give, then it dies. Does that make sense? <coughs> Life is always fighting entropy. It's always wanting to give more, and we want to give what? Less. And because we do, we never reach our full potential. Now, the Word of God is for us to do the works that Jesus did and what? Greater. But we, we don't want to do that. We, we mentally just want to have a nice little religion in which we can go and talk about God and pray and then do the rest of the week what we want. That's not how it works. That's a religious mentality. Entropy, because that's your, what you're putting forth rather than daily, right? Trust the Lord with all thine heart, lean not to thy own what? Understanding. We're supposed to have daily understanding, growing, developing. But if you're not developing, then entropy is kicking in. And that's what's difficult to understand. So why does the Bible say, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind? David put forth how much of his effort? One, all of it, all his heart, all his soul, all his mind. Jesus put forth how much? 100%. So we're seeing these men and women of God that put forth 100% and more. So the, I, how many here believed it was carved this way? How many here believed it was actually carved out of granite that way? No, it wasn't. What happened to it? Entropy, right? It's breaking down. And another 10,000 years, what will there be? Nothing. What's going to happen to the pyramids? They're going to, they're going to reach that balanced state with their environment. So no matter what we do, everything is trying to reach the lowest level. Everything's trying to break down. And that's what life is trying to fight against. That's why... When I talk about the chicks, if the chicks in the egg don't give forth 
everything they've got to get out of that egg, they should not, they shouldn't live. How many here have ever been born? Nobody's been born. Okay. <laughs> when you were born, you came out of the, did you see what happened? You ever seen how, that's where your whole body, when you're born, your whole body, which is about like this big, fits through a little hole this big. That includes your head. And the head goes and turns into like a, like a cucumber, right, as it comes out. Yeah. Of course, it comes back again. But if you ever see a newborn babe, looks like an alien creature. <laughs> it's like it doesn't look right. <laughs> His head's all elongated and stuff. Like, whoa. But that's because of the way it comes out, and the bones are really malleable. But the, this is where today we're not allowing that child to fully what? Develop. Because we're doing cesarean section. I'm not saying there isn't a need for them, but it should not be for everything. That we reach because when a woman doesn't produce that from her uh, canal, birth canal, then what happens is the, the milk doesn't initiate. And if the milk doesn't initiate when she tries to breastfeed, her body's antibodies don't go in there. And a lot of the, her, the, the mother's digestive um, components that for her body and defense mechanisms never make it in. So the, body be, the baby becomes sick and has problems. Now, of course, modern medicine comes in there with you know, all these different things that it puts in there. But how did people survive before that? How did our grandparents come into being? So, hey, Gazuntai, God bless you. So, in entropy, understand that if I had opened up that, which I did, opened up that cocoon to let the butterfly out, I didn't help him, I killed him. He came out, but he couldn't fly. He was not fully developed, so he died. But if you take an egg in which a chick's not ready to, it's, it's, it's in there getting ready to hatch, and you break open that egg and let him out, it's not going to make it. So the problem is we're supposed to give forth how much? All our heart, all our soul, all our mind. It's not a half-ass thing. Well, I gave my half-ass. I half-assed it? I, I gave a little bit, right? That's not, that doesn't work like that. So because everything has entropy. Say so like, and you, how many have ever heard the word before, entropy? Ever heard of it? Okay, all right, so if you're depending on if you're listening to someone who's dealing with um, signals, communication, physics, um, so we're just going to define it really quick. And thermodynamics, it's a measure of the unavailable energy. Like how many of you have ever had a car, and as you're driving it, the spark plugs aren't hot enough? What happens at the back end of your car? It didn't, it didn't, you should know the answer, right? If the spark plugs aren't hard, hot enough, what happens at the back end of the car? Uh, you get a lot of more fumes than what it should. You get a lot of raw fuel. Yeah, a lot. Right, so it didn't, didn't fully combust, so it goes out the exhaust pipe and comes out as big black smoke, right? Or a lot of other nasty stuff. So that's entropy. That's that stuff that wasn't put forth, wasn't all the power wasn't used. And so some of that power got away. Does that make sense? So when you stop and think about what is it you give all your heart, all your soul, all your mind to, what is it? If it's not God, then what is it? See the interesting component of this. But well, I got a business, yes. But I'm in business to keep it under as a, as a, a zero of God. You understand how that works? So that my business glorifies God by me making it stay in that environment of God. Is it easy? Uh, no. But can you do it? Yeah. Right. So that is a usual considered to be a measure of the system's disorder. And where, it was, where you have disorder or it's not working fully, that's what you call what? Entropy. Because it doesn't get better, it gets what? Because if you have foul spark plugs, what happens next? Fuel. It's, it's a case. 
Okay, You're right. Entropy. Right yeah. <laughs> it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. So you have to you have to be able to really give it and make that correction. So if you have a house and you got termites, what do you do? Well, just you know, I'll just ignore them. No, you got to maintain that house, right? All right. So it's a property of the system state, and that varies directly with any reversible change in heat in the system and inversely with the temperature. So heat, how do you make something accelerate in its entropy? You ever heard of cooking? What are you doing to the food? Increasing its what? Entropy, so that you can digest it easier. You're breaking it all apart. If you let it go and just let it rot, it breaks itself all apart. But it's not very tasty. In fact, there's meat that they do. They age it, and they let it start to rot, but they put things with it, and then they season it. What is that called? That's what is that? Um, there's a special. They pepper it, and they well jerky. No, and the other one prosciutto. Prosciutto. They just it's never refrigerated. They just want the rot, the meat to rot, and they keep the seasonings in it, and then they after a couple weeks, then they start slicing it and eating it, and it tastes like cooked food, but it's not cooked. It's just breaking down. Pardon? Europe. In Europe, yeah. So, very directly, now what happens? How do you stop or slow down entropy in, in food? That's why it says temperature. You put it in the what? In the refrigerator. And the fr refrigerator lowers the temperature and slows down the what? Entropy. It's, it's going bad, but it's going bad really, really slow. Got it? Okay. So if you put forth, whatever you put forth in it, you ever notice a battery? You get, a, you get one of those uh, lithium batteries, and then what happens is you plug it in, and you don't power it all the way. You know what you just did? Not so much the newer ones, but lithium, uh, lithium ion, right? What happens is when you, well, I don't have time to power it all the way up. I'll just put it up this way. Guess what your new, your new uh, top is? That one. And so I do it again to power it, it discharges, I power back up, and I don't have enough time to do it up to its full point. Now it's this, guess what? That's my new top. And this is what happens with batteries, this is what happens with equipment. If you don't, if you drove your car at five miles an hour all the time and never went into second or third gear, what would happen to it? So, so could you? So unless it gets repaired, you're stuck at that. It stays that way, doesn't it? It'll be hard to bring it up. So if you have a, whatever you put your your minimum at, if you don't put forth a hundred percent, you'll never know your limits. And if you put back less than all, then what you wind up with is you are increasing your own what entropy. Got it? So when we come to the Word of God. How much empathy and empathy? How much entropy is in the Word of God? Because it, obviously it's, it has to have some. Everything has what? Entropy. Obviously, you, I do. I do, right? Or else I'd still look 18 years old again. But I don't. So obviously that's not, that's not true. I have entropy, right? Would you like some? No, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so entropy. All right. Another way of saying it is the degradation of matter and energy in the universe to a ultimate state of inert uniformity, to where everything is the same. If I take an um, ice cube and I put it in a hot tea, what happens? They both what? They reach that point of uniformity, balance. When you, when you take metal and you smelt it, not smell it, I mean smelt it into shape at something, right? And it rusts, what does it rust back to? What it was before, it was mine. goes back into being basic elements. So that's that inert uniformity, where it has no shape, no nothing. It's just all broken down. Now, the Word of God says, Thus thou art, and thus thou shalt return. What does that mean? Entropy. Got it? 
I know I look, you think I look good now, you assume I look like this. No, I don't know, that's not true. <laughs> All right, now in communication theory, how many have been in a room where people are speaking more than one language? Or someone with a heavy accent? So if you're talking to people, two or three people at the same time, unless you understand everything they're saying and they're saying it correctly, or they're mispronouncing it, you won't understand what they're saying. Happens to me when y'all speak Spanish, or I'm like, right? When I, Si, yo hablo español por como un vaca francesa. You know, I mean, I, I don't, I speak, <laughs> I don't speak Spanish that well. So you, everybody needs to slow down, but they don't. They just go into high, you know, they go into turbo mode. <laughs> Was that a full sentence or one word? You know. But in communication, a measure of the efficiency of a system, such as a code or a language, in the transmitting of information. Now, how many times have someone talked to you and you went, huh? Huh? What? Now, what is that? That means you, that person is speaking with, or your environment has what? Entropy. There's some either noise, or they're not pronouncing it right, or they're too far away. Patricia's in the room, and she starts talking to me. I can't hear a word or understand she's saying. It's a very high entropy, right? <laughs> All I got was the, right, and I'm like, what? And, and she goes on and on and on, on, talking, like a stream of, I don't understand a word she's saying. Why? Too much what? Entropy, the distance. That is, I can't, you, any, anyone else suffer from that? From women talking and you, and, you know. <laughs> All right. Different messages that can be sent by selecting from the same set of symbols and thus indicating the degree of initial uncertainty. I hear it, but I don't know if that's what it means. Now, this is interesting because in the new information theory, you use entropy to carry the signal. That's what is being used. You're transmitting entropy rather than an actual intelligence. Now, when you stop and think about the Bible, to ensure its unbreakability, it speaks in what? Parables. To ensure it has a way to penetrate all noise and all possible entropy. It creates its own entropy and uses that to transfer the signal. Isn't that neat? So that's why the Bible has no entropy, because it's communicating as entropy. That hearing they may hear and not Seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not what? Understand. Now, who else is using this? There's a, who is the name of that, um, um, that company that makes uh, communications that has a big um, arena, or not arena, a, a coliseum or whatever? Qualcomm. Qualcomm, yeah. Qualcomm has what's called an MSD, which is using noise to transmit. Same thing as the Bible uses by using parables, which I think is so cool. All right, all right so when we, have we ever heard of the word baud rate? You know what that is? That's intelligible bits of information that make it to the receiver with noise or limited bandwidth. And if it can get through that, that's your baud rate. It means bits per second, baud rate, okay? That's the bits of information. Does that neat? That makes sense? Now, the Bible, how reliable is the signal? Like when Patricia's in the room and she's going, and I go, yeah, and she's like, I'm so well, well, how can you make this trouble? May I make the joy and beat it? Not going to have any joy to me, Paul. I went, what are you saying? What's wrong? Massive entropy. Right? I can't, I'm not getting, I'm, there's zero baud per second here. I'm not getting any intelligence. Got signal, no intelligence, right? I'm not saying that about her. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm saying about <laughs> But you understand, I'm not getting it, right? Huh? Too, I know. Man was found beaten today. Anyway. But now you understand. What are we talking about? What's the magic word? Entropy, that's right. So, 
Another aspect of the Word of God that you can trust, not only is it set its own baud rate at maximum, providing you understand the parables, and at the level you're at, remember how many levels are there? Four. And only as you mature to that level can you understand what's being said. How many ever walked into an operating room with doctors? What do they talk about? They talk about the trauma to the femur, right? You're like, what the hell is that? So when a metabolistic rate has been, has been elevated, like, what the hell is that? A person may have a hematosis. What is that? Is it crawl on the ground? Do I step on it? What is it? So all these terms that doctors use deliberately. You're not a doctor. Why is he saying it in front of you? Because he doesn't want you to know what he's saying. Let's call it jargon. Medical. All right. So when it comes to the Bible, what do we, what do we have? Well, depending on what level you're at, how many have ever been with little kids, right? And what do you do? You spell it out for them. Hey, W-H-E-R-E, T-H-E-C-O-O-K-I-E-S. And the child's going, well, why, why didn't we write it down? <laughs> Where'd you put the cookies, right? <laughs> you don't want the child to know, right? So you spell it out. What is that? Again, you're adding entropy for her or child, or mini person, rug rat, curtain climber, right? You don't want them to understand what you're communicating. So God does that too. God wants to talk to those who have the same heart as him. And a lot of times, if you're with, you're with a friend out, out in the wild blue or out somewhere, and you only want to communicate with them, like, oh, isn't oh, is that hotness or is that hotness, right? And you, but you don't want anyone else to hear it, right? Does anyone ever do that? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> right, so this, this, this again, you want maximum entropy for everybody else, but not the person that's receiving. That makes sense? All right, so what else does God do? Well, every verse links up with other verses. So if this was a puzzle, how would you know if one was missing? There'd be, one, there'd be a hole there, wouldn't there? How would you know if there was an extra piece in there? there it would like, all right, there's no hole for it. Someone popped it into the box, and there's no place for it to go. All right, let's give you an example. Let's go into Matthew. Matthew... Last chapter, which is chapter 28. Chapter 28. And verse 19. And it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now Jesus and the other 18 times in the other Gospels, I thought that was pretty intense, has said, doesn't say that. He says, in my name. And the Apostle Paul references that Jesus spoke about in his name. And Jesus also refers to and carrying out the word of God in Jesus' name. Why isn't the Apostle Paul speaking in terms of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost? Why isn't, why, why does Jesus say in, in my name and all of a sudden here, name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? What's up with this? Now, another interesting thing is this is, the, um, in the third century, people that were Christian wanted to be able to, um, wanted to have, let's see, there it is, all right, wanted to have the history of the, um, of the Christian church recorded. And a man by the name of Eusebius Pamphilius wrote the history of Christianity up to that period of time, which is, 340 AD. Now, what's interesting about him, and I've marked all the places in here. This is an English version of his writings. 18 times he quotes Matthew. He quotes Matthew 19, but the scriptures he's using isn't the same as ours because he quotes it. Are you ready for this? 18 times. I got it all marked here. See? 18 times he quotes it as Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in my name. So he used in my name. 
So apparently his scripture, so how do you tell if you're, you, someone threw an extra one in there? Now, let's imagine, let's just say that one time Jesus did do that. Right? Let's just say that. Okay? Everybody say that. Maybe Jesus did that. Ready? Go. Maybe Jesus did that. All right? Let's, maybe he did that. Right? Though it disagrees with all other places in the Gospels, all references. But nonetheless, maybe on an oddball situation, he said, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Which makes no sense. But where's the blood covenant? I don't understand. But anyway. So when we go here, now let's go into the book of Acts. Now, Jesus said, baptize him in the name of the Father, Son, and the what? Holy Ghost. All right? Great. Now, we see Philip in Acts. He doesn't do that, does he? He, can, he gets him to confess that Jesus is Lord and baptize him in Jesus' name, bab immersing him in the water, the knowledge of God's word. Well, that's ducky. Now we go into chapter 2. Here he is, Peter's preaching. And in verse, chapter 2, verse 22, you men of Israel, heed his words. Jesus of what? Nazareth. What's he teaching? He's teaching in Jesus' what? Name. A man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Why is Peter deliberately disobeying what Jesus said? And if he is disobeying, well, how come God's blessing him? And he does miracles. I don't understand. Well, maybe that was just it. Maybe God was just being gracious or whatever. All right. So if you keep reading, it doesn't say anything about the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So Peter blew it there, really, or did he? All right. Now let's go into Acts chapter ten. There's a lot more in here. Oh my gosh! But I'm just going to hit the high points. So I said, well, that's because he's talking to the Jews. He's not of other nation. All right. I'll take that. Let's go into Acts chapter 10. This is Cornelius. Now watch for the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, all right? And, and chapter 10, verse, 20, verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. All right, where's the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost? But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. All right, where's the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost? And the name and the word which God sent into the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus. He's teaching in Jesus' what? Name. What about the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Not there. Peter deliberately disobeyed. And yet God blessed them and got them to speak in tongues. And You know what? How do you tell if there's a peace been added? It doesn't, have, it doesn't fit anywhere. So now we know. I just wanted to give you an example of how you can work the word because it doesn't what? It doesn't fit anywhere. It was added. And if you want to know exactly when it was added, since Eusebius wrote the history of 340 A.D., it had to be between 340 A.D. and 425. And that's how we have so many manuscripts with it that have been copied since then. Is that cool? Now you know some really intense... So now, do we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? No, we do not. We pray in the name of what? Jesus, the anointed of God, who God raised from the dead. But what about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? Look, that's not in there. Is it wrong? That's not, I'm not saying it's wrong or right. I'm saying it's not in there. A man shall not live by bread alone, but every word of what? So if I'm sitting there saying in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, it's, I'm the one that's got a problem. Because it doesn't fit. And there's no earlier manuscripts that have it. And I want to live by every word of God, not what man added to it. Does that make any sense? All right. So you see this Pamphelius is like one of my coolest friends. I read his books. <laughs> He's a lot older than me. In fact, he passed away a long time ago. But anyway... <laughs> Now, let's find out other. how other way does the Bible protect itself. I want you to understand that you can trust the Lord, trust the Word of God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and have no doubts. Do you understand? I want to make sure that every doubt is removed. Matthew 5, 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot 
or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. How many have, had, how many have noticed your tittles fading? Got your tittles? Does anybody, hey, you want to see my tittle? <laughs> you show me your tittle, I'll show you mine. No, what are you talking about? What's a tittle? So verily I say unto you, to heaven and earth pass away one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law. You have all your jots and tittles? Have you checked your tittles? See if you still got them. Do you even know what it is? <laughs> I mean, last time I checked, I don't have any tittles. <laughs> Maybe I should go out and buy some. I have no idea. <laughs> How do you get some tittles? Order them, I guess. Go come up by Amazon. Likes to have some tittles. No, what are we talking about here? What is this? You ever grab a Bible dictionary? Like, what the heck is that? You look it up and like, doesn't help at all. Makes no sense. It sounds like someone just decorated the manuscripts and illuminated manuscripts with these funny little curves and stuff. No, there's more to it. So what are we talking about? This is the jots and tittles. Joel is the, is the smallest character. It's almost like a little apostrophe with these big letters and it's a little bit of, it's, well, I made it oversized here, but it's usually very small. And that easily is, is, is lost. People don't see it and they just Right? They just think it connects up here. Now, now, so the tittle is this little peaky thing. You notice how it goes, like when you, when you do your, your pen, you go like this, you go like that, that little peaky thing. Then you go like this, you go, and you go straight up, that little peaky thing, right? The, the little, that's a tittle. And you draw the next one, you go like this, you go, yep. And that's another, what? Tittle. Let me see your tittles. All right, what's this? Tittle, what's this? Tittle, what's this? Tittle, oh, you can recognize tittles when you see them. What's this? What's this? What is that? They're called cronlets. I, I wrote it up there. <laughs> <laughs> now, what is this? Well, obviously, this is a word. This word is at the furthest end of that line. Because when you, you count the characters, so with this is the last of that character in that line, you'll know that there are one, two, three characters before this. And if you pass down over here and you see this, but it's got little marks on it, then you know that there are others preceding it. Now you can total up every long of sight and there should be, that page should have a number. So every letter has a number. How often it's used on the page, how often it's used in the line, is all counted and cross-counted to make sure nothing is what? Lost. We didn't do that with Shakespeare or Kant, or Plato, but that's how it is. This is modern day Jews, that these dots here, the, you see here, those are called vowel points. So the ooh, ah, e, a, all those, those are all, when you see these, that's the sound you make. They're vowel points. Is that neat? That's modern Hebrew, that's biblical Hebrew. All right, now, now, I'm going to show you how important this is. How many of you ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Right? You see, yeah, I went and saw them too. They're really cool. <laughs> the book of Isaiah goes all the way around this room and back up and around. That's how it's huge. Long, long scroll. Not to mention all the other scrolls. But in our modern day Bible, we have Isaiah 21 8. And he cried, A lion, my Lord! I stand continually upon the watchtower in the daytime, and I am set in my ward whole nights. What the heck is that all about? Does it make sense? No. But the problem is this word right here. Because when you go to the Dead Sea Scrolls, and you look it up, 
same verse, and it was, it was written in 300 BC, you find out it's missing a jod. That one letter, which changes it from, when you take out that jod, it's no longer said aloud, it said a lion. Put the jod back, and it says he said aloud. So because the Bible was, the, 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 the Old Testament is such precision by the sophists, the, the, uh, the sophomists, that they would actually count every single letter, give the total on the ends, count them down and have total there and down there before they went on to the next manuscript. And that's why when you look at there, if you look at the edges, they got totals here. <laughs> Of course, this one's missing it, but you can see that you barely see it. They counted the letters in each line. Isn't that amazing? That's why we, when you look at something that's 300 BC and you compare it to now, perfect except for one verse, which I showed it to you. So, can you depend on this? Absolutely. The Bible has got the minimum amount of what? Entropy. All right, so are we understanding the importance of this? Can you trust the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind? Yes, because it, it, there's nothing, it doesn't contradict itself, ever. If there's an apparent translational error, it becomes evident because it doesn't fit with all of the scriptures on the same what? Subject. So it's not difficult. So in 2 Timothy 3.16, we're going to go over this. All scripture, does that mean all? All. Is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in what? Righteousness. Do we, do we understand those words? You know, I, I get really embarrassed because I don't, if I don't know something, I want to find out. I hate faking it. You know, I mean, I like, I don't know what that means, you know. And so I look it up. That's why I got all my books. I, I hate being wrong. I mean, if I am wrong, thank you for pointing it out to me. I'll correct myself. But if I'm right, <laughs> I can prove it. All right, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. What are we talking about? How reliable is this? That's three words. How many, how many words are there? Three. Inspiration of God. Three words. Guess what it is in the koine? How many? Two. Nope. Two. Nope. One. One. Uh, one word. Just one word. Theopanustos. Theopanustos. Now, panusta, right? Nosta hagion is translated spirit, but really the word numa means to breathe but it's only a one-time deal. Punustos is a breathing, a breathing. So it's a really heavy, intense breathing, all right? Now close your eyes. Close your eyes. Now get real close and breathe really heavy in his ear. Ear? Ear. Can you tell someone's there? <laughs> 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 but understand that's so weird it's basically heavy breathing on the day of Pentecost they heard it like heavy breathing in the temple a, a mighty wind or a heavy breathing so that movement of the wind is like heavy breathing and that was on the day of Pentecost Theopanustos is God's breath. And that's weird. That is so weird. That you don't have, it's not, was God's breath, God's breath, God's breath. Where am I? Elbow pod? <laughs> God's breath, right? It's not God breath, breathed. <laughs> it's not that God breathed, it's God breathing now. Everybody inhale right now. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. You see what I'm saying? It's, you can tell you're breathing. You're alive. 
entropy is on its way out because you're. <laughs> so we'll take the word theo. Break, come here. Come down. Right there. There we go. Stop. All right? Theo means God. That's right. And it's God. Now we take the next one, Pneustos. Breath. Breath. And it's like happening. So when you got the Bible, it's God's what? It's his breath. Now when you talk to Muslims and you talk to rabbis, do not call it scriptures. Call it the breathings of God. You get instant respect. Because they, the Jews, when they're not around Gentiles, refer to the scriptures as the breath of God or God's breathings. Same thing with the Muslims. So if you're talking to, you're explaining to a Muslim or a Jew, always use that term and you get instant respect. Okay, because that's how they refer to it when there's no Gentiles around. And that's exactly correct. All right, doctrine is the right sign, right? It's the way you, the correct way of doing something. Reproof is when you're not doing it so good, and someone needs to say, hey, you know, every time you break the egg, it breaks the yolk too. Try hitting it a little lighter <laughs> so it doesn't fall into the fire, you know, just kind of like, and then break it open. Don't go bang, because then <laughs> the eggs don't come out so good. <laughs> All right, reproof, and you're just showing them how to do it better. Correction is when you just took the eggs and threw them away. <laughs> Have a glass of water. You know, that's, that's correction, right? No, man, you cook the eggs. Now, we've got these words, four, 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 four. What's up with you? There we go. Ta-da, four. Now, all these are four. How many are there? Four, four. four. <laughs> What's four mean? Reason, right? No, only reason. This is not the word like that's like gar. This isn't. This is a different word. This is not the one that's for reason. This is the one that has the purpose and direction of where you are going. When a child comes up and says, "I'm going to start. I'm going. I'm going to start elementary school." All right. Well, why does he go to elementary school? So he can go to what? When he graduates elementary school, go on to? Middle school. And then after that, he goes on to what? High school. So elementary school is not the end in itself. It has, because there you go, the reason you go to elementary school is for you to go to middle school. And you go to middle school so that you, for, that's pros, you can go to high school, and you go to high school so that you can read and write and get a job or go on to college. So that's why pros has an end result, and when is it mentioned? At the what? At the end, right? Because that's where you're going. So we start with doctrine, reproof, correction, elementary, junior high school, high school, and on to instruction in righteousness. So this is the end of the goal and direction and purpose, right? This is it, pros. So you go from here to here, to here, to here, for instruction in what? Righteousness, and that stops. So the whole, so how would we say this properly in English? You would say, all scripture is given by the inspiration and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, which is, see what I'm saying? Instruction in righteousness, does that make sense? I want you to understand how to properly translate. The translators didn't do bad, but they didn't do great. Does that make sense? So which is? Because the Bible, or if I say a book, you tell me what it is, okay? Romans. Corinthians. Galatians. Ephesians. Philippians. Colossians. Thessalonians. See how it's put together. 
So is this true about the Old Testament? Yes, it is. The whole Bible, all of it, is doctrine, reproof, and correction. Why do we have these three? So that we have, which is instruction in what? Righteousness. Now, what's the problem? Four has been translated ridiculously. It's been on two, 340 times, two, 203 times, with 43 times, four, 25 times, against, against, 24x. <laughs> gives you a totally different perspective when you do it this way. Among, 20 times, and 11 times at, and not translated six times. Now, the ridiculous, there's, they just arbitrarily chose the word 53 times. No consecutive, no consecutive usage. Just 53 different words. And slapped it in there for this word pros. It's a problem. So understand, it's not, they, they don't understand the usage of this word. It's, I'm going, like, you ever been fishing, fly fishing? Or you know, not fishing for flies, but I mean, you know, fishing, right? Yeah. right? And if you want to get to the other side of the stream, what do you look for? Rocks, right? I take this one. To get to this one, to get to, you got, and you take each one, each one is a step to get to the next one with the goal of reaching the end. Well, don't you keep going? No, because the purpose was the end. What's the end here? Instruction in what? Righteousness. Isn't that cool? Now you understand what most people don't. All right, a prep, so if you take it in its usage, it's preparation of direction, the goal, the direction, the destination of the relationship, the how it's related, the destination, motion towards. Those would be the best translations according to usage. Make sense? I don't know how it's written in the Spanish Bible, but that's how it should have been translated in English. I'm showing you how to read the Bible, how the Bible interprets itself. Are you special? Yes. Is this cool? Yes. I love this stuff. I love puzzles. That's why I can't find my socks in my drawer. Too much what? <laughs> What's the term? Entropy. Too much entropy. My, you ever seen my drawer? I open up my, my, my man, there's a lot of entropy in there. <laughs> I can't even get my drawer open. Anyway, <laughs> I'm just, I want you to understand what entropy is, right? Now, if you take a, if you take a, um, if I take ping pong balls and I have a box and I put all the blue ones right on the bottom and I have a white ping pong ball and I put them on top, right? Then I shake them up. What are my chances of getting blue on the bottom again and white on top? If I keep shaking it, keep shaking it, what are my chances of making it to where blue's back on the bottom and white's on top? It's like astronomical chances. And I may get most, but not all, and there'll be one thing while I'm sticking out, because the entropy is way too high. Got it? Because it keeps changing, and each, each, each effect will not produce and get it back to its original. So we have constantly greater and greater what? Greater and greater entropy, entropy right. OK. So what's this word righteous? De Al Cassini. What does that mean? Remember that it's, it, it's making the right, well, I shouldn't tell you right now. I'll just keep going. It's to think, judge, speak, and act from the perspective of God's greater reality. This also is used for a lawyer when he speaks for another person speaking from their perspective. When a judge speaks it from the perspective of the law and trying to keep the balance. So it's that balance to think, judge, and speak. And in context, we're talking about all scripture, right? To help us understand how to think, judge, speak, and act from the perspective of God's greater reality. Does that make sense? Not our feelings, not someone else's feelings, but what does the word say? I want to please God, not man. Now, does that fit with the rest of the Bible? 
Do, does our, does our uh, jigsaw puzzle fit with all of the scripture on the same subject? Well, let's go to Proverbs 3, 5, and 7. Ready? Trust in the Lord with a part of your heart. doesn't say that. I just added a word. Why don't you say something? Right? Trust the Lord with what? All your heart and lean not unto thy own. That's what Jesus said. And lean not to your own what? What happens when you go by your understanding? You need reproof. If you go too far in your understanding, you need correction. Right? In all thy ways acknowledge him. Him who? God. And he, God, shall direct thy path. Be not wise in thine own eyes. I know that's what the word of God says, but God doesn't understand what I know. Yeah, he does. <laughs> I do. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. What's evil? Being wise in your own eyes. Every time I think I'm right, I'm wrong. Every time I think God doesn't get it, God does get it, and I'm the idiot, right? Not a few times, a whole bunch of times. 2 Timothy 3.17, that the man, now what's the purpose of this? For the instruction in righteousness. The question is, why? For what purpose? Ready? That the what? Man of God may be perfect. Now, this doesn't just mean men, because it's an it's a all-inclusive noun, kind of like Pharaoh. Queen had Shetsup. She was Pharaoh. And also, um, oh, what was his name? Um, was it Thutmose? Yeah, Thutmose III. He died, and his wife took his place, and she wore the beard and held court, and she became the Pharaoh. So, was she called the Pharaoh? Yes. Was she called the Pharaohess? No. <laughs> no. And if you walk up to a policeman and it's a female, you don't go, are you a policewoman? They should probably hit you, man. <laughs> the last thing you want to do is get hit with a, by a woman cop. Anyway, you understand, there, it's a joke. <laughs> it's, the whole thing is silly. That the man of God, so the man of God is anyone who speaks, well, I almost gave it away. We got to figure out what this is. <laughs> That the man of God may be what? Perfect. I don't want to be perfect. Then you can't be a man of God. The object is to get to the point of being what? And that's for that perfection. But what does this word perfect mean? How many ever woke up in the morning and go, oh, today I feel perfect? You ever had that? Does anybody ever feel that way? Wake up in the morning and go, oh, I feel so perfect today. I can't stand it. Right? You don't, it never happens, right? So what is this? How many here would like to be perfect? All right? Today, I am perfect. Right? All right? I just glide around the floor. I don't even walk. Anyway, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished. Now, what kind of furniture do you want? <laughs> How many say it's, it's truly or thoroughly? Is it thoroughly or thoroughly? Thoroughly? Okay. Anyone else? Thoroughly? Thoroughly? Thoroughly. Not thoroughly. What's the problem here? You ever try and wash your hands thoroughly? Yeah, there's no problem. You do it every day. How about thoroughly, where you actually wash the bones? That would be thoroughly washing your hands. The bones are scrubbed, tendons. No, I don't even go that far. We just do the outside. In truly means where? Inside as well as out. All right, so you're perfect, truly furnished. Not finished, furnished. <laughs> On to purpose, again, that's what that's for, all good works. But now, what does that mean? I know you all read, the, how many have read this verse before? How many understood it? Anyone understand it? All right, so now today there's no excuse. First of all, what's the man of God? Uh, uh, pardon? I almost gave it away, didn't I? Yeah, no. We're going to find out what a man of God is, right? Someone who looks like, you know, John Wayne. No, no, no. Charlton Heston. No. No. Because it can be a woman too, right? So here we go. So let's find out 
the first person labeled as a man of God. Deuteronomy 33.1. And this is the blessing where with Moses, the what? Na -na -na -na. Right. What did God put on him? His spirit. So here's a person who has the spirit of God, God's breathings in him. Blessed children was before his death. So he, Moses, was a man of God. Well, what is the job of a man of God? What's he supposed to do? Exodus 7, 1. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made thee a God, not capital, small, <clears throat> not a God as in makes heaven and earth. A God to Pharaoh and Aaron, thy brother, shall be thy what? So if God is the real God, then what does that make us? If you're the men and women of God, that makes you a what? Prophet. Just like if Moses is God to Pharaoh, then Aaron was his what? Prophet. So when you entered that covenant with Jesus, him making his Lord, be God raised from the dead, you became God's what? Prophet. You can speak for who? God. You have the right and the authority and the qualifications. You may be young and inexperienced, but that easily you can get through. So a prophet is one who speaks for who? God, as God gives utterance. All right. One who speaks for God. What are we talking about? That the man of God. What? The man of God. Who, what's the man of God? One who speaks. Have you ever heard him speak God's word? Yes. Oh, 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 oh. Have you heard her speak God's word? Oh, 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 oh. Have you spoke God's word? Yes. Oh, oh, oh. What's that? Have you spoken God's word? Oh, 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 oh. Have you spoken God's word? No. Oh. <laughs> Where's my laser? Yeah. <laughs> Put you, when you speak, because God doesn't speak to them, that you, they don't qualify, but you speak to them, then you're speaking for who? God. I, especially the accuracy of God's word. Right? Now, what I want to explain is the fact, when I say you can trust in the Lord with all your heart, according to his word, right? Now, when I was in Tennessee several years back, um, there was a young lady, uh, she, a mother. She had several. She had three kids, and um, she was losing her place. She didn't have any income, and she says, "What can God help me?" And the answer is, "What? Yes." So, but I'm not God. She needs to go who, to God. So I helped her go to God, and um, God showed her. And so she told me what it was. I went, what? And she says, yeah, that's what God showed me. I'm like, okay. So I helped her do it. What she saw was, now she's already eight months pregnant, seven maybe, and she's not showing. And she, was a, she had been a nurse. Got it? So what God showed her was to put her uniform on, even though she's pregnant, and go to this hospital. And I'm like, and? She goes, she's, that's all God said. So I'm like, okay. So I, I lent her some money so she'd get her uniform adjusted. And uh, I drove her. She didn't have a car. I drove her to the hospital. And she was all excited. And it was the right, I said, it was the right hospital. Yeah, she goes, I go, which door are you supposed to enter into? She goes, that one, I think. I said, okay, go. So she got out and went in there, and she walked up to the head nurse and says, I'm here to go to work. She says, okay, report up to the second floor. So she did, and she worked there for two weeks, well, a week and four days, until payday came. And they couldn't find a paycheck for her. But everybody loved her work. She worked harder than anybody else. She was really committed. She was just a magnificent nurse. So I said, there must be some confusion. So they kept her on. So I find out she was never hired. Now they're in trouble. <laughs> they have to make a decision. So they paid her for the time and fired two people, kept her. 
Does it make sense to do that? No, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. But did God tell her to do that? Yes. That she trust in God with all her heart and do it. Yes. Remember Moses? How many here remember Moses' mother? You are old. <laughs> but you understand what God said, okay, what, she goes, what do I do with my baby? And she goes, put it in the river. She's like, no. God, what do I do with my baby? Put it, you know, there's word of knowledge and there's word of what? Wisdom. So she asked, okay, God, how do you want me to do it? Make a little ark, a little boat, and put him in there. Do exactly what, and, all right, so when she had it all ready and the baby was ready, when do I put it in the water? Not yet. Wait. Wait. Wait more. Okay. Now. And she went and put it in there. And just as the princess comes down to the water, she finds the baby. Now she needs a wet nurse. And his, her other daughter walks up. I can get a woman to nurse it for you. She goes, okay. So she went and get, brings her mother over, and now she lives it. You understand how this is so weird? When you trust in God with all your what? Heart, all your soul, all your mind. So God don't mess around. God's like really excellent. All right, so we want to know what this perfect is, right? How many here want to be perfect? God wants you to be perfect. But what does perfect mean? I'm so good looking, I can't stand it. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about perfect. Perfect and concerning Doctrine, reproof, and what? Correction. Fully instructed in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect. Well, what's that word perfect? Well, let me introduce you to the word artios. Artios is really cool. It's only used two ways. A ship about ready to make, its, they make a journey to another port. It doesn't have a place where it can stop. It has to go from where it leaves directly to its destination. There's no gas stations. There's no you know rest places. You just say now everything. The water you need to have already on your boat. Food you already have to have on your boat. There's no place to get some. So all these things are required. You need everything you're going to need has to be there. All right. The other place it's used is a caravan. In a caravan, everything you need for the next six months has to be on those camels or mules or donkeys. There's no 7-Eleven, no gas stations. You plan your trip according to the, the um, what do you call it, the, uh, the desert, and then you've got oasises. You go to that oasis, that oasis, and then you make it. What happens if the oasis has no water? you're in trouble. You always bring extra water with you, just in case. Do you bathe in it? No. Then everybody must stink it. Yes, they do. <laughs> but anyway, that's why you go into the caravan sorry before you go into the city, so you can bathe and not drive everybody running away screaming, ah. Right. So what's this word? Truly, truly, inside and out, truly what? Furnished. What's that word? Well, that word is also exartizo. What's the difference? Well, this is the adjective, and this is the verb. Same word, just conjugated. So, if you're going to use perfect, that the man of God, you, may be perfect, truly, in and out, perfected. If you're going to use furnished, then you have to say, you have to be consistent that the man of God, talking about you, may be furnished, truly furnished. Got it? Lacking what? Nothing. Everything you need has to be there. Isn't that cool? Here is an 18, was, this was in the 1847, I think it is. In the Ottoman Empire, this is a going through the Sahara Desert. You see how far back that, that caravan goes? It's a caravan. And that's exactly how they traveled. Traveling that way for over a thousand years. At the screaming speed of? Mile and a quarter an hour. 
Yeah, that's as fast as a camel will go. Boom, 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 boom. That's it. They go from side to side. That's a long, notice there's, there's um, kind of like a, um, the, women, the men walk, kids and women get to ride donkeys or horses. There's not too many horses here. There's a donkey but no horse. And so there's a man there. There's a horse. There's a camels. But you can see how it works. That's how it would go. Now, along the line, there are military, like here, just to protect it in case it gets attacked. Because there's no policemen, right? Everybody has to be able to defend themselves. I mean, I wish they could live back in the Bible land times. Well, you better be able to be able to defend yourself. And that's why you see here, he's got a rifle and a sword. And so is every one of these guys all the way down the back. And the speed is a mile a quarter an hour. So you lack absolutely what? So everything they're going to take with them, all the food, all the drink, everything they're going to have is in this caravan. So what are you lacking with God's word? Everything you need. God will direct you to help you get it, fulfill it. That's why it's very important. Okay, now that the man of God may be what? Perfect, truly perfected, right? Unto all good works. Okay, all right, all right. What's a good work? Walking little old lady across the street. No, that's not what I think. Right? Donating to the Republican Party or the Democrat. No, no, no. Save the whales. No, no, no. What's a good work? Mm. Whoa. Let's find out. Genesis 1, 3, and 4. And God said. Yeah, yeah. God said, let there be light. And there became, that was, became light. And God saw, and that word saw is examined, right? If I say, here, Joaquin, give me seven inches between your fingers. You want to see the ruler? <laughs> right. So if, if I, and I used to just, you know, give me seven inches, people go, eh, and I, I measure it, right? And if they were right, I go, got it. And if they were wrong, no. So what we're talking about here is God has this image, right? And it talks about that in Isaiah and other books. God sees it, then God speaks it, and then he examines it to see if it matches what he, the image he has. How many, of ever, how many women have cooked dinner, had an image of what it was going to be like and how it's going to taste, and wind up giving it to the dogs? No? Giving it to your husband? Okay, just checking. <laughs> this tastes like crap. Hey, honey, here, eat this. So God saw there was light, and God saw the light, and he exam the word saw is examined it, looking at it, eyeballing it, see if it's right. That, good. So God declared it what? Good. Got it? And God divided the light from the dark ones. Okay. With that in mind, we now define what good is. It's God's word coming to pass exactly as God expressed it, how God had it in his image, in his mind. Does that make sense? Okay. Mark 10, 18. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? Is Jesus good? How many here think Jesus is good? No. Jesus is good. Well, if you call Jesus good, you got a problem. And Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good. So only the nuns are good. No, no, it's not, it's not what it says. 
None are good. No, not, no one. No one. Does that include Jesus? Yes. Does that include John the Baptist? Yes. Does that include Moses? Yes. There's no one good. Is she a good cook? No. Okay, good. Do <laughs> <laughs> you have any good friends? No. No. See so, yeah. Man, when you say but you put the word good on there, you got some problems. I say God is good, then you can't use it for any other reason. You've contaminated it. You've added what? Entropy to the word. Distorting it. You you contaminated it. I saw a good movie. Really? Man, that was a good dinner. Really? Was it the Last Supper? What? <laughs> well, for you, it's going to be. Anyway, <laughs> you understand the problem. If you say something is good, then you've added entropy to God's usage, and you're bringing it down. That's what God's word needs, is more ent entropy, right? No, it doesn't need any entropy. But you're speaking for God, right? Oops, it's a problem. That which God is strictly for God should stay with God. Does Jesus understand that? Yep. Why callest thou me good? Well, Jesus has to be good. Nope. Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. Only one. Who? God. Can you be good? Nope. Can you be perfect? Yes. Can you be good? No. Isn't that weird? You can be perfect, but you can't be good. Now, what happens to religion? Religion wants you to be good, saying you can't be perfect. God's word says you can be perfect, but you can't be good. See the difference? Isn't that weird? That is so weird. And you be good. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Good luck. Ain't happening. No matter how hard I try, can't do it. Can't be good. <laughs> no, I'm serious. <laughs> I can be perfect, but I can't be good. Got it? So you can't call Jesus good. The only one that's good is who? God. So what's good works? And it's fulfilling and bringing to pass God's what? Word. Understand, fulfilling God's word is what? Good works has to do what God says is good. And as you do it, that's where, the, that's where it becomes doing good. It's not being good, it's what? Doing good. All right, let's take an example. Jesus. Jesus said, not, not me, I'm not good. But, Acts 10.38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit, and with power, who went about doing what? There it is, hot dog, right? Jesus is not good, but he did what? Good. Was he perfect? Yeah. He was not good, but he was perfect, and he did, he, he do, he did do good. Got it? Does that make sense? Although oppressed the devil for, where was God? God was what? With him. Does the Bible lie? No. Nope. Where's God? God was with him when he did those works. And when you do them, where's God? With you. Isn't that cool? All right, now, what I'm concerned about, what's the name of this, this whole teaching? Entropy. entropy. How do you slow down entropy? How do you slow it down? You do what you can to slow it down. How many remember something, been told something, and, then, and within a few minutes you forgot what it was? You, you knew, I knew, I, I, I don't know where the hell I put it. I put it somewhere, <laughs> right? You put it, you had it in your hands, you put it down. 
You don't remember where you put it? Uh, entropy. <laughs> That's right, entropy. So how do you keep from having entropy when you put something down you can't find it? How do you figure it out? How do you do it? You grab it, and you're going to set it down. You set it down. Then you look away and say, where's the pen? You see it in your mind? Look down. There it is. Now you've created two pathways to your brain on that subject. And you'll be able to remember things for weeks to two or three weeks of where you put it. Because you've doubled the path. If you've only got one, anything else coming in there is going to cross over it and cancel it. Put two in there, it'll help it. If you really want to give it more, halfway after you leave the room, go, where did I put it? Okay, got it. Then you've added a third one. right? Your eye, your brain is an image processor. Yes? All right? So you're in the room, and you get an idea, you go out, out into the next room, and you can't remember where it was. Go back to where you got it, because wherever you were looking at, look at it again, and the image comes right back. The brain is an image processor, not a thought processor. And that's why I believe, but we think in images. So whatever you're looking at, and then you go, what the hell was it? Go back there and look at it again. There it is. Got it now. Boy, I ain't going to let that go. You see how that works? It's not a senior moment. It's just the way things are. Does that make sense? All right. And he said unto them, When you pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Wait, 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 wait. When you have God's thoughts and images, how is the word of God to come, the kingdom of God to come? Are you not there? Then the kingdom is there. The only thing lacking is you to what? Speak and act. You're carrying this whole kingdom inside of you going, hee, 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 hee. I'm a secret agent, right? So you speak, then you're no longer secret. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's God's image. That should be what? Our image. To do God's what? Will. His good will. Thy will be done as it is in heaven, so in earth. So, how do we not forget? Give us this day our daily what? What are we talking about? We're talking about spiritual things. Knowledge, the word of God is doctrine, reproof and what? Correction, that the man of God may be what? Perfect. How are you going to be perfect unless you have all of the knowledge you need? That means you need it daily. Daily, you have to be surprised. Information is not surprise. Surprise is when you go, oh, I didn't know that. Like, oh, that's nice. No, that's information. My fish is a tang. There you go. That's information. You can't do anything with it. Tang. Whoopie doo. But what I'm giving you is not, inf is not information. It's knowledge. Who are you? But now, what happens if you don't, if you go a whole day without thinking God's word? What happened to those connections in your, your neuron pathways? They fade, and then eventually you don't remember anything. When you were in school, what was your first grade teacher's name? All right, second grade teacher's name. <laughs> Here's to you, Mrs. Robinson. Anyway, <laughs> I won't go any further on that one. All right, but you see the problem is that if we don't keep it, you what? Lose it. I'm losing my mind. No, you're losing the image. Whatever you put in there, you say, can I have a napkin? Here. All right, all right. I always wanted to have a napkin. All right, now this is really impressive. It impressed me. I'm easy to impress. See, see this? 
that's about the total amount of space for you to hold memories on. Since you were born, born. When you got to be about seven, that's about what maxed out, and then you grew, and all because if you look at the top of your brain, I mean you may want to examine it now if you wish. <laughs> but what happens is it's like this to get more space. It's not smooth. It gets wrinkly. So it can get more room in there to fit it. And every time, because that's it, that's all you got. Something, if you get something in, something has to what? That's why nothing sticks, unless you repeat it to yourself. Unless you reestablish it, re send down new mirror neurons, new track. Got it? Where's the pen? I can picture it. I can see it. I look down. There it is. Now, as I walk away, I go, okay, where is it at? I see it. Now I'm looking at it from a different position. Now I've got three lines. Things you want to remember where they're at, that's how you do it. Now you've had three canals of neurons. It will make it and won't be overwritten. Isn't that cool? All right, well, eventually, after a couple of years, maybe, but anyway. I just want you to understand how the brain works. Remember, you're an image processor. That's why whatever you look at, remember your image. And if you want to duplicate it, look at something else and get it. Now you got two exact images, reinforcing it. All right, Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, and that's daily bread, right? But by every word of what? God. You can't sit there and say, oh, I already know it already. No, there's more to learn. Always more to learn, unless you feel you've already matched and you be with Jesus Christ. I don't think I'm there yet. I mean, if you think I am, let me know. I don't think so. Now, if you think you are, well, I better sit down and let you take over, right? Jesus answered the saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Bread is understanding. But by every word of what? So even if you don't understand it, you still what? Do it. It may not make sense, but when you do it, after you do it, it will. It's not whether you understand it or not. Just do it anyway and watch what happens. Is that cool? How many have already experienced it? I know that's what the Word of God said, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> and then you do it, and you're like, whoa, it works. Why? When you obtain understanding, you need to maintain it. If you had a house and you bought it, you obtained it, now what are you supposed to do? Maintain it. You bought a car. That's my car. Are you changing the tires? Are you rotating them? Are you adding gas, oil, checking the spark plugs? No, I don't do that. Car's fine. Uh, you won't be much longer. What's going to happen? Atrophy is going to go in there. Yeah. When you obtain, then you must what? Maintain it. It's the state of mind, your skill, your ability. You've got to keep yourself sharp. Matthew twenty-five twenty-nine. What is what is entropy? The added randomness of things that come up. I remember had something happen to you that you were going to do something and all of a sudden something came up and you couldn't do it. And you told someone, I'll be there. And all of a sudden something comes up and you can't make it. You look like an idiot. Always think of ways to get it still accomplished. If you see it in your mind, make it happen. Have backups to make it happen. Matthew 25, 29, for unto everyone that hath, that's that image, that's that reassurance, that's to ability to obtain. Everyone that hath, you get it, you obtain it, shall be given. He'll get more understanding. And he shall have an abundance. But him that hath not, he barely put forth any effort. I tried, nothing happened. No, no, you see it as already yours. I did for five minutes, but then, you know, nothing happened. No, that's not how it works. You see the problem. 
you have to keep it. I told you it was a fight. What's the name of this? Entropy. To get you to give the absolute minimum. To give it just a basic, and that will be your new high point. Don't do that. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Give it your all. And, and expand your what? Your limits. You'll never know how much greater you are than you think until you break your limits. For unto everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have an abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath, and it will all be forgotten. Why? Entropy. Entropy of the mind Entropy of your understanding, entropy of your knowledge, entropy of life itself. We are to agape God with what? All our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our what? Strength, right? So I hope that blessed you. Great secrets of life. The things look like hell, doesn't it? <laughs> right. So now you understand entropy. It's really intense. It's, if you look around, you go, man, that thing's maxed out in entropy. <laughs> that's like, that's got high entropy on it, right? Car, that car's going down the road. It's going, sir, 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 sir. Tire's going, wooble, wooble, wooble. A little high on the entropy. <laughs> Not high octane. It's high what? <laughs> Entropy. <laughs> High octane will be different. You know, like the SEAL team, right? They want to find out when you go to be a SEAL. Not a, ooh, 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 I'm talking about, you know, Navy guy. And you go out there and they make you, they find out where your limit is and they push you beyond it. And then two days later, they push you beyond that. And for 11 weeks, you're going beyond your limit every single time. And you amaze yourself that you can do this. You're just like, I can do that. So when you're faced with the impossible, there's no way you go, I can do this. <laughs> because you did the impossible before. Always go for the max. Right? Makes sense? Can you imagine being a fighter? And, and get knocked up by your own shadow, that's like really bad. <laughs> that's what entropy does for you. All righty. So, Father, thank you for the greatness of your word, and thank you for each person's life here, that they can excel in everything they touch, that you, Father, will show them that they can do even greater than they ever could imagine. That, Father, as they push themselves to the, beyond their limit, that you will open up even greater ability that in every respect, in every situation, they can be a more than conqueror. So I, for their lives and for all that we're yet to do and accomplish, Father, we give you all our praise and glory as we stand within your shadow and walk in the footsteps of your firstborn from the dead, our risen and returned Lord Jesus, your anointed. Okay, I love you guys so much. Right? Ready? Give it your all. All right. One, two. You are God's what? Best. Yes. Oh, yeah.